so some dude had hoarded the crap out of a former church. The new owner who inherited the hoard was selling it off. Let's take a look at what I uncovered from what became known by me as the Denfield Horde. This is what I originally went there to buy, the PowerBook 520. I keep getting requests to do a video on Mac laptops, so I figured I should have some. And this is a good one to have. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. What'd you play that for? And it wasn't just the laptop. It came with power adapter, SCSI data cable with adapter, system software discs, all in an AST bag. If you like the smell of must, you'll love this bag. <laughs> the Apple Store produced a much nicer looking PowerBook bag about that time. The seller said it did not power on, but beautiful condition, beautiful design with its curves and two-tone casing. Quite a departure from what Apple did before. I offered him $50, which he accepted, and then threw in a second dead unit with a broken hinge. That was cool. The PowerBook 500 series were Apple's first 040 processor laptops, released in May 1994. LC040 to be more precise, meaning no floating point unit on the processor. With PowerPC chips already on the market, Apple put the processor on a daughter card for the first time ever in a Mac, so that it could be easily upgraded to PowerPC. They took the groundbreaking design of the PowerBook 100 series and completely updated it with many more firsts for the laptop industry. Built-in Ethernet was a first in the laptop space. Two battery bays, doubling your charge. Or use the left bay for expansion cards, if you could find any. Stereo speakers built into the lid, which were not there on the next PowerBook revision, so they must not have been worth it. Microphone built in. They updated the keyboard with a row of function keys. We talked about trackballs last time and a trackball had come built in on every PowerBook up to this point. But for the first time, no trackball, but what they called a trackpad. One of the first implementations of a trackpad, and the first laptop computer to place a trackpad in this position, where it remains to this day on nearly all laptops. Although I prefer IBM's TrackPoint, aka mouse nub. No, I don't. But we do get accustomed to modern trackpad features. <laughs> Files not opening. The 520 was the black and white low end of the series. While they also had the bargain PowerBook 145B when the 520 was released. Based on the original PowerBook design, it was so cheap they didn't even give you system discs. But the price was right if you wanted a portable Mac, but couldn't afford the 500 series prices. Also, the 145B could not connect to an external monitor. The 520 could with the included adapter, but not included with this one unfortunately. Also new was the aspect ratio, going from non-standard 640x400 to the 640x480 that we all know and love. The batteries in the 520s have a cap to mesh with the rest of the case, with built-in retainer clip. If it, if it could work. But the batteries are so dead and corroding which did the 520 no favors. And someone replaced the nickel metal hydride batteries on one of the packs and sealed it back up with scotch tape. <laughs> Finally, a couple of flip out feet that can be used to tilt the keyboard. The Horde had a lot of dealer only stuff, so I'm guessing that he got the assets of an Apple reseller somehow. I found this binder there, an official list of replacement parts for every Apple product from 1977 up until the end of 1994. Under reference materials, it lists a VHS service video for $35. I have a better idea. This sounds more like a horror movie soundtrack than a training video. To move the pointer, simply slide your finger across the trackpad until the pointer is in the desired position. Yeah, well I don't need a video to tell me that. Whoa, whoa, no, no, no. 
Ugh. Like that wouldn't shatter into a million pieces if I tried it. This is the power on key. Yeah, this prototype and very early production units had a more universally understood symbol on the power on key than the Apple one they ended up using. But I benefited from the confusion because guess what? With the adapter, it powered on. So he just didn't know about the power key and assumed they didn't work. On the 1996 PowerBook 1400C, they just said to hell with it and spelled it out in black and white. Listen for the startup chime of what must have been a prototype in the training video. The PowerBook 520-540 offer full-size 640x480 active matrix and dual-scan advanced passive matrix grayscale displays. That was a mouthful. I know, the guy talked over it, but here's the actual chime for comparison. Now the screen leaves a lot to be desired. Some obvious ghosting effects, but still plenty bright. The hard drive works. Lots of apps on the drive. This guy wasn't fooling around. Oh, he wrote an ad in 2002 for the sale of a bunch of Macs. That'd be an awesome collection for someone. Including two PowerBook 520s. <laughs> it has 36 megabytes of RAM with 500 megabyte hard drive. Definitely not a stock config in 1994. 36 megabytes was a maximum for the 500 series. And the hard drive was formatted in 2000 with Mac OS 8. I'm surprised the processor daughter card had not been upgraded to the 100 megahertz 603E PowerPC card that Apple promised and eventually made available. CPU upgrade card maker Newer Technology made even faster 603 cards, up to 183 MHz. It's been said that because of this daughter card design, Newer Tech had made a prototype G3 upgrade card. But the supplier of the daughter card connector inexplicably destroyed the mold for it, meaning no more upgrade cards and no G3 upgrade card. Sounds sinister. An ADB port was available to plug in an external pointing device, for example, the Silhouette. I hate to say it, but the pool ball, the iconic 7 ball, the, the iconic 7 ball works better than the balls that came with it. The floppy drive, it works. There were literally hundreds of 3.5 inch discs in the hoard. I took any that looked interesting, like any Apple discs and these Muglo discs. Macintosh Users Group of London, Ontario. Most cities had Macintosh User Groups back then, which made great social events. To put it to sleep, you just had to close the lid. A green light blinks to let you know it's in sleep and not off. That's another cool first. How is it activated? The closing latch also presses a switch to put it into sleep. The 500 series latch is made of plastic, and I know because the second unit had the latch busted off. Okay, let's shut down. Damn parents. Surprisingly, the broken 520 also works. has 8 megabytes RAM and 160 megabyte hard drive, which was the stock hard drive. The base 4 megabyte RAM was on the underside of the daughter card, and the rest was on a very odd looking RAM card, which plugged into the daughter card. And check out this simple aluminum heat sink on the heat shield. The second unit has System 7.11, originally known as System 7.1 Pro. This was the base operating system for this series. The keyboard has turned olive green, which I think is what yellowing from sunlight looks like on gray plastics. This 520 is strictly in four parts territory. I've been looking for a SCSI laptop hard drive to bring back my PowerBook 170 for example. The ultimate resource for info on the PowerBook 500 series is Joe Kaderma's page preserved in the Wayback Machine.
Link is in the description if you enjoy old school web pages that are just densely packed with information. This happy family would not last long. Within months of the 500 series release, the 145B was replaced by the PowerBook 150 and the PowerBook 540 with a faster processor and with a higher quality grayscale display than the 520 had was dropped because simply Apple did not have the production capacity to produce all four model lines with the overwhelming demand for the 500 series. I haven't looked too deep at the PowerBooks before, but found it fascinating to explore this PowerBook model. Truly a trailblazing work of art made just before the wheels fell off at Apple and they built the PowerBook 5300. Sorry, this 5300 ad is as close as I've got to a 5300. Anyway, very glad to have rescued these from that terrible hoard so that they can be properly appreciated. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode of the Denfield Horde. Okay, we're out. Now these are Macintosh acquisition numbers 165 and 166, storing them in bin number 39. This video was released as part of Marchintosh 2022. Check out your favorite vintage Mac content creators and discover some new ones. You'll see more from the Denfield Horde on my Patreon, which is still pretty new and I'm working on stuff there as well. Maybe some giveaways will be offered.